Hello and welcome to this first In Conversation with the Australia Council, a discussion series where we talk about how arts and creativity impact the lives of all Australians. I'm Wendy Weir, Executive Director of Advocacy and Development at the Australia Council for the Arts, and I'm joining you tonight from Camaragal country in the Eora Nation, land that has been home to conversations about arts and culture for over 70,000 years. I pay my respects to all First Nations colleagues and friends joining us tonight, and also to Elders past and present. Due to the wonders of technology, my guest this evening is also joining me virtually, although it does feel like we are in the same studio. It's my great pleasure to welcome author and journalist, George Megalogenis. Welcome, George. And thank you, thank you for Wendy. joining How us. Are you? I'm well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us to discuss where we find ourselves and where we might be going, because this has by any measure been quite an extraordinary year. So we're going to have a chance to talk about some of the bigger themes. It's that time of the year where we all reflect. Um, We've had a year of bushfires, pandemics, and everything else that's come with that. Um, but one of the sectors that has been hit hard um, and was hit first is the culture and creative sector. And it's been pretty devastating. So I'd like to explore some of your thoughts about what this means in a broader context and what it means particularly for Australia's economy and culture. So any initial thoughts before we kick off? Yeah, so the initial thought is, remember this begins as a health crisis, but a health crisis that's global in nature that, that shuts down uh, pretty much all the world's economies at the same time. So 70 to 80 percent of activity in the first lockdown and then again in lockdown number two in Victoria is, is shut for health reasons. But the economic, but the economic crisis is, is nonetheless real, even though uh, not a single uh, employer or not a single employee, not a single artist, not a single member of the audience, not a single person uh, that runs a restaurant or goes to uh, sit down and have a meal at a restaurant or goes to a cinema to watch a, a motion picture, or all the people attached to all those transactions, not a single person in any of those transactions uh, uh, caused the health crisis, but depending on where they sit uh, and depending on, on how they make a living and it depend on how they um, move, around the, move around a community and a country, uh, the, the losers are very random. So because you're, shutting, because you're shutting mass events, because you're shutting things that involve people, in large numbers because you're shutting things indoors, because you're shutting things outdoors that involve a, a lot of people. Uh, you're creating, you're distributing your winners and losers on the economic side of this shock in a, in a way that we haven't seen before. So, you know, sort of putting my sort of nerdy hat on, most recessions up until this point tend to be very male heavy. So construction, manufacturing, they bear the brunt of all the redundancies and you could pretty much you could pretty much uh, assume 70 to 80 percent of all the job losses over the course of the recessions of the 70s, early 80s, and again the one at the start of the 1990s, which Paul Keating said we had to have. 70 to 80 percent of those jobs guaranteed uh, were lost by men, and and a significant portion of those jobs lost by men were in retail. Sorry, were in construction and manufacturing. Now the smaller portion that were lost by women uh, were lost in places like retail. This has flipped every one of those equations on its head. Majority of the job losses are, uh, are being borne by women, not men. And the sectors that are at the front of the line are not manufacturing and construction or even retail. Retail, remember, was an essential, so essential industry and it stayed open. Construction stayed open. Uh, we were still mining during the pandemic. Uh, the sectors that really got it in the neck uh, were hospitality, so hotels, restaurants, cafes, mm. the travel business, to the business of moving around the country, and especially the arts, uh, creative and cultural sector. And in fact, even six months on in the uh, six months on in this crisis, we still have roughly one in four jobs in the performing arts part of the creative and cultural sector uh, unemployed, having lost their job in this um, in this episode. So, epic and different is probably the best way I'd describe it. Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. Um, one of the things that I have been musing on personally is that for a long time, you know, at the Australia Council and certainly within the sector, we've been trying to, to make the argument and be, be 
seen. I've often said it's like we're almost like the palm olive of Australia in that you're soaking in it, but nobody really knows. But I think in, in the media, certainly for the last few months, that recognition of what's happened to the arts and entertainment industries, the creative and cultural industries, has been uh, more pronounced than, than ever before. And we've now got some really strong evidence, I think, around the economic value of the arts, their contribution to GDP, the substantial workforce, and also the way that it contributes to all those things that you were just talking about, whether it is hospitality or how it drives tourism and so on. Um, but importantly as well, how it drives productivity. And I wanted to ask you, why do you think that this is still such a difficult um, principle to, to get broadly understood the way that the cultural and creative industries are such a strong economic driver? Yeah, I think there's, a, there's still a sense um, that Australia is a, is a sort of we talk about political and so, sort of socio-economic cultures, uh, we still look at ourselves as a very male-centred society. So we still look at ourselves as a society that makes things. So even though the manufacturing sector is no longer the largest employer in the economy, we still look at um, the making of things as genuine economic activity. Now obviously our economy has transitioned quite dramatically over the last four or five decades from a, from a blue collar and a manufacturing base to a services base with a larger share of the workforce now in so-called pink collar um, uh, um, ends of the economy, sort of female heavy sectors like health, education. And the difficulty in seeing arts when your framing begins uh, making things, the difficulty in seeing arts is you think that the creation of an idea or the creation or the or the or the sort of making of a sculpture or or, or a performance uh, most people tend to look at those things and think well okay there's a bit of inspiration there but there's nothing mechanical about it so i do not envisage it i can't see all the bits of the of the i can't see the bits of the economic um equation there to be able to add it up for myself in my head the same way i could i could i could add up in my head you know from the farm gate to the kitchen table uh, the agriculture mm. sector, or I could have made up in my head from all the little bits and pieces that went into the manufacture of a car through the delivery um, and driving the thing out of the uh, dealership. So I think that's the tricky part. The tricky part for people is, is, is understanding the back office and understanding all the components. But the second part of it, and I, without getting too bogged down in the, in the dollars and cents, the other part of it is the creativity, and you've alluded to it, the productivity. So a lot, of, a lot of the sort of genuine innovation comes from a creative and a cultural mindset, not from uh, somebody else in another country hands me down a, a template to make an automobile and then I just count up um, all the widgets and I've got a manufacturing sector. The, the innovation tends to come from the creative side of any labour force and that's essentially the prime business of the arts. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you think about um, the kinds of skills that won't be automated in the future and thinking about the role of service industries in, in driving productivity and so on. Um, and the need, as you just referenced, around experimentation and adaptability and thinking about things differently. Um, do you think this will be a greater area of focus as we start to come out of the pandemic? I, I'm, I'm conscious that in the past, when I was about 10 years ago, I was working in a, um, a government program that was providing industry support and I was providing support to the creative industries in particular. But the actual program was built on a manufacturing template, which I found quite extraordinary because these are industries which are not at all resembling the manufacturing industry in any way. And so to try to translate that kind of support um, over to a radically different uh, business model was, was simply not possible. But do you think there is a growing awareness in terms of industrial policy that this might be a latent and potent um, area to start investing in and taking seriously? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. So my, my answer is obviously it should, people should be more aware of it because the pandemic is forcing you to think about the things that got shut down. Mm. And there's a, a sort of an ache in pretty much every community about the things you can't do anymore or haven't been able to do the last six months. We're in a place now where we can start to go back to things that we weren't allowed to do. Now, the television screen just shows you going back to a pub or going back to a, to a restaurant to catch up with friends that you haven't been able to see or touch. Uh, but most of the nourishment people will get when things reopen again are the things they experience. And, but again, in a sense, the media will frame it as, you know, crossing the border to Queensland. Mm. So 
So there's a, there's a, there's a mindset that uh, understands what's missing, but when they put the things back together again, I fear that they'll still be putting them back um, based on a very, very once over easy assumption of what people do. <laughs> And so, you know, let's, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a particular statistic which has intrigued me since I've had a look at it. And there's officially sourced data, but when you count up all the components, the, the cultural and creative center, uh, sector, and Scott Morrison accepts this definition, by the way, because in June when he was referring to 600,000 jobs uh, attached to the, to the arts broadly, he was actually taking the job numbers based on this definition of the sort of cultural and creative sector. Now you tote it up at about 6% of GDP. Yep. Now 6% of GDP in both uh, a contribution to the economy and in terms of numbers employed is larger than tourism, which was Scott Morrison's previous sector before he entered uh, politics. So if you sat him down with that balance sheet, he'd say, okay, I would, I would rate that above tourism. But tourism is, is sort of something you can see in a generic sense, uh, whereas the creative and cultural sector is split up in a number of different ways. The second part of the 6% figure, and this is probably the more important um, story uh, when you look at where our economy is going into the future. 10 and 20 years ago, and even 10 years ago, manufacturing is still the largest part of the economy and it's the largest employer, but it's been in sort of trend decline across all rich societies for the last 30 to 40 years. Basically, manufacturing peaks as an employer and uh, contributed to GDP in a country like Australia in the 60s. And it's in long-term decline from the 70s onwards. Manufacturing was always larger in terms of its economic contribution, you know, what it creates, uh, than the creative and cultural sector broadly defined. Up until 2017, 18. Because manufacturing, because it's been in sort of secular decline, uh, passed the arts on the way down. So it's actually physically smaller and its contribution, it still employs more people, a couple of hundred thousand more, but it's, um, it's, it, in terms of its contribution to GDP, it's smaller. Now that makes intuitive sense, of course, because we're moving from a, man of, a, a making of things to a creating mm -hmm. of things society, it was a services-based economy. But you know, sort of to round, it, round off the thought, my concern is whilst it's obvious to an economist what's going on, uh, your culture will have difficulty putting a name to what is obvious. Um, because a lot of the mindsets are still in that either physically making things or going and experiencing things. And when you talk about experiencing things, we might be sitting in a theatre experiencing something and I could put a dollar value on that and I could, I could have a look at everybody on stage and everyone at the back room that put the show on, uh, but I will still probably get a better bang for my buck in terms of uh, media attention. And bear in mind, I'm a journo, so I'm sort of trashing my own profession <laughs> here. Um, you get a better bang for your buck in terms of media attention to saying, look at all these people crossing the Queensland border to go and stay uh, on the Gold Coast or, or go and do schoolies on the Gold Coast or go to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, in a visual sense, that's an easier thing, but it's the least complicated part of the economic story. Our future is in the creative side, is in the innovation side of the, um, of the uh, sort of, you know, the Rubik's Cube of, a, of, a, of an economy, uh, not in the buying an airline ticket, flying from destination A or B, hopping out at the other end and, and consuming products. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think about tourism and thinking the strong appetite to get Australians moving around the country again, and also, as you said, this is what gets picked up on crossing the border, moving into different places and, and so on. Um, we've done some research at the Australia Council in the last couple of years, which has really shone a light on cultural tourism and the, the fact that this is a really strong driver for people to move um, domestically. It's one of the, it, it seems like a no brainer when you think about when you're going to Europe or even you know to the Americas or so on, you, you seek out those cultural institutions to understand the meaning of a place. But thinking about what cultural tourism has been doing for you know regional centres with those small regional uh, festivals or those fantastic art galleries or the silo art trails or whatever, it's a, it's a massive driver for tourism. And we've also identified that people who are travelling for culture as well tend to go for a longer time. They tend to spend more as well and they tend to go further. So they're what you know the tourism industry would call a high value tourist. Um, do you see domestic tourism as something that will take the place of Australians' love of travel now that we are in a situation where we can't jump on planes and go overseas? Uh, oh, good question, good question. Look, obviously, uh, 
take the global perspective here, the virus is still, is still burning the rest of the planet. Mm. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, China, South Korea, on and off Japan, other parts of Asia, and Israel on and off, Greece briefly, and a couple of other countries in Europe uh, have done okay. We've done exceptionally well. Really well. Uh, but the price of doing exceptionally well is a closed border. And whilst the virus is burning around the rest of the globe, the US, uh, continental Europe, and especially the UK, these are places that normally we would have a lot of people coming from mm. uh, for all sorts of things, right? Not necessarily to come and see shows. Uh, you know, they may want to come to a rugby test or they may want to come to a cricket test or there may be a soccer tournament that attracts them here. Whichever way, whichever way you cut it, the, the idea of travelling for the experience, not for the, you know, to see as rock necessarily or Uluru, but to come and see something, to come and to, to come and to be at a place with other people, uh, that gets closed off for the international tourist, not just the year that we're having, the year from hell that we're having now, but into 2021 and, and theoretically even into 2022. Mm. Now, Alan Joyce of Qantas doesn't expect a return to normal for international travel for his airline, Qantas, uh, until 2022, until the back end of 2022. So what happens in the next year or so? Mindful that we have to keep the border closed uh, to minimise the risk of another flare up in the virus. And we saw how quickly the thing got out of control in Victoria. Uh, it was a real gut punch where we had to lock down that second time. Uh, and Melbourne being separated from the rest of Victoria and the rest of the country uh, was very, very difficult times for us. I think we don't want to go back there. And that means authorities will err on the side of international lockdown so to maintain so you know on the assumption that you get a lot of free movement domestically then that is pretty much the only thing that can happen for the tourism sector but that is the only thing that can really happen for the arts that is really the only thing that could happen for sports it puts audiences back in place and if you've got audiences back in place then people can perform for you and people mm. can create for you and look I think this is probably the most important part of the conversation for every sector that was penalised through no fault of their own to contain the spread of the virus, that they really have to be, once they're able to establish a, a safe way of doing business, um, you know, with a piggyback of a closed international border, which lowers the risk of transmission from overseas, uh, that they should be given every opportunity to, to demonstrate, um, well, given every opportunity to invite people back to be with them. So I think that's, um, that's almost a discussion that you don't need to have sector by sector. You could almost cross, start crossing the streams and talking to everybody in the same performance space, the same activity space, the same mass gathering space. And if you could figure out a way to make people, make people almost neutral in terms of their view on, you know, the men and women of Australia or the boys and girls of Australia turning up to things, then you've probably raised all boats at that point. I've been thinking a lot, uh, you know, all our summer festivals and, and those things, which often, you know, would have a mix of Australian content, but also definitely a heavy helping of international content as well. Um, here in Sydney, you know, the Sydney Festival has just been launched and it's going to be a 100% Australian festival. And I've been thinking about what that means for our sense of cultural identity as well, because it feels like it can be recognising there's a lot of challenges in the cultural sector and a lot of organisations are simply trying to keep the furniture right now but there's also a lot of opportunity for creative development at this moment where you can't you know proceed as business as, as usual and I'm thinking that that kind of um, avalanche of Australian cultural content that will be available to Australians um, in a way that it perhaps hasn't been in the past could be quite something for our understanding of who we are as a nation do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is this is actually a key point. If you, if you think about our lifetimes, and one of the reasons why it's sort of everything is economic is since the 80s, we've opened ourselves up to the world economically. This was the whole Hawke Keating mm -hmm. grand experiment, floating the dollar, deregulating interest rates, you know, taking the umpire out of the, um, the, the setting of wages, lowering the tariff wall, opening ourselves up to the world. The last 30 years or so, we've had a lot of people coming from overseas, um, sort of um, contributing to bottom lines of domestic organisations. You think about um, education, so you think about universities with foreign students. You certainly think about um, the cultural sector in terms of the international stars that you bring in. 
you always pay over the odds to get them there, but that tends to make you turn up to a writers' festival, turn up to a to, a, to an arts festival, or go to a um, or, or go to a, or go to a music festival. Now, absent absent of the international travel, and also absent of even if you could, in a quarantine sense, maybe bring a couple of stars down, uh, you'd almost recommend against doing that because I think you're right. You've tapped into the thing that is waiting to happen, which is all these people that have been locked down, haven't been able to perform and create for a year, can't wait to get out in front of Australian audiences. And to my mind, it takes you back to potentially, now potentially, um, you'll see the compare and contrast in a minute, the difficulty of this, this analogy. But in the 70s, the 70s was quite a, a, a huge decade in terms of how we thought about ourselves as a country. Film industry had its sort of first flourish of independent movie making. The book trade, we were, we were writing books about Australia and Australian themes, even a, thing like, a little thing like Countdown, had groups like Skyhooks and then ACDC write, writing Australian songs for Australian audiences, which then went, in ACDC's case, obviously went global. That 70s um, culture was a 70s culture that, hid behind, that the economy hid behind a tariff all. So in a sense, it, it was, it's a version of what we're about to witness uh, coming out of lockdown, but with the international border still closed. Now, the difficulty with that analogy for my mind, and maybe this is the way to think about what's missing, the 70s, of course, both sides of federal politics especially, uh, even at a state level, certainly in a state like Victoria, uh, with Rupert Hamer as Premier, were encouraging the arts actively, and we were encouraging an Australian storytelling. So there's a fair bit of controversy at the time, obviously, about whether the gallery should have bought blue poles, and there are a couple of, there are a couple of people at the margins that thought the Opera House probably should have been turned into something else, maybe apartment block or something. Um, but at that point in time, the culture not only was strong and building a national voice, it was being enabled by politics. And I think that's the thing that's the thing that's missing. I'm not necessarily recommending you go cap in hand to politics and demand an equivalent of, uh, of, of Gough Whitlam's investment in the arts. Um, but the sector itself is still in a position to, to, in lockdown, coming out of lockdown but still with the international border closed, is in a position to let a trillion Australian flowers bloom. And I say that in a positive sense, not in the Chinese sense during the Cultural Revolution when they wanted to chop them off. This is to actually let them, let them broom and grow. Yeah. So at that point, you would hope if the culture could get cracking, uh, that politics might go, hang on a minute, there's something going, out, going on out there in that community that I, I want to be a part of. Because remember, politicians need an audience like everybody else. And if the audience is somewhere else having conversations that they haven't had yet, they should be there as well. One of the things that um, I've so enjoyed following your work for many years is that you're such a student of history and, um, and you've also tracked the kind of major demographic evolutions we've seen in Australia in the past few decades and, and you've sort of referenced um, you know, how, how vital migration has been for our economic success and so on. So thinking about that um, thousand flowers blooming and thinking about what it means for our arts to truly reflect us as a nation. Do you think that um, there's a big opportunity here for Australia as we are, truly are, to be represented as part of this potential flourishing? And, and what are the dynamics and uh, kind of bridges we need to, to build to make sure that our sense of national identity is, is true and relevant and not something that's kind of still looking into the past? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. Um, I, I, you sort of alluded also to the political side of it, um, which is a, a sort of set of human beings that look like, nothing like the country. Our federal parliament is, is more male than the society at large and is wider than the society at large. So there is, in terms of representation, really, uh, and look, politics understands this, and there have been att many attempts to try and fix that. But put that one to one side, I'd sort of raise it up the front because this is always one of the difficulties in this conversation. So again, I referenced earlier the 70s. The 70s, the parliament looked a lot more like the society and it was possible for politics to imagine um, uh, sort of kick-starting a great, uh, and, and sort of a big run of nationalism in, 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 in Australian art. This time around, the complexity of the country and the way I, I, sort of, I sort of describe it, we are today, 
to all intents and purposes, a majority migrant nation. And we haven't been a majority migrant nation since the 1890s, since just before Federation. Now, by majority migrant, I mean the majority of the population is either born overseas or has at least one parent who's a migrant. So 29 point something are born overseas, a bit over 21% uh, second generation. I Australian born, but to migrant parents, at least one migrant parent. So if that's your majority, to all intents and purposes, that's your mainstream. So reflecting that mainstream requires not just one voice, but every voice to be heard. The other part of that equation, though, is that, so I can get you to 50, 51% uh, first or second generation migrant, but if we tack on the extra three or 4% that identifies as indigenous, then the white part of Australia, third generation and older, uh, you know, offsprings of free migrants and convicts going all the way back to 1788, uh, uh, the minority, I don't want to disrespect them, but I hear their stories still to this day, but I'm not hearing the stories of the 51, 52, 53, 54% of the Australian community. Now, how do you empower that without insulting the other half? Because you don't want to, I guess one thing you don't want to do is to move from a, a predominantly Anglo-Celtic storytelling for Australia to a, a, a cosmopolitan, an exclusive cosmopolitan storytelling, which is in a sense, recent arrival, plus has been here all along, so the Indigenous part as well. And the only way I can square it, because it's a difficult question, and I've been posing it to myself a lot, because whilst you can explain the complexity, getting to that other side of that complexity with a story that binds us all, the binding stories are in the Indigenous stories, are in the welcome to country story, are in the multiple language groups and the multiple tribes. That's where the binding story is. The binding story is in the Indigenous space, not necessarily in the first or second generation migrant space or the third generation or older Anglo-Celtic space. So I would be erring on the side of releasing Indigenous voices before I do anything else. So that's, you know, in a sense of disempowering my people kids of Southern European background. I'm disempowering pretty much everybody else who might be watching it who's not Indigenous. That's not the intention. The intention is, is, is to switch and to refer the question probably to the only group in the, in the Australian population that are capable of uniting every person here. We have a story that gets us to break past the silo of migrant or the silo of local born. And that's uh, how you go from that point that's probably up to every organisation to figure out what that looks like, because uh, I don't think you ever want to micromanage the detail at every at, at, at sort of the at sort of the community level. The other thing is you're asking, you're posing a question uh, that almost by definition you don't know what the answer is. You have to understand the question you're framing, and then knowing who you want to trust to answer it, and then beyond that you can't put words in their mouth. Yeah, it's an extraordinary anchor, I think, that that First Nations culture at the heart of everything. Um, and when you were just talking about the mainstream, you were reminding me of um, a, an interview that the African-American Nobel Prize winning author Tony Morrison gave to an Australian journalist. Um, it must have been in the 80s or 90s. And the journalist said, yeah, will, will you ever, yes, yeah, it was, I was trying not to name, but um, <laughs> would, you, would you ever consider writing about white people? And, and Morrison responded with, I have. And she said, no, but I mean in a substantial way. And um, it, was, it was a very powerful response where Morrison said, you would never ask a Russian people why they didn't write about Russians. And she said, you, you can't understand that I am the mainstream. You ask me if, but it's about recognising where the mainstream is and, and where Australia mm. is right now. But that's, um, those are fantastic thoughts. I could speak to you all night, George, but we have promised our audience that we will um, enable questions from them as well. So uh, let's have a listen to a question from Philippa Allen all the way from Berlin. I've been living in Germany now for over 20 years, and I must say that over the past decade in particular, I have noticed a tendency that um, Australian artists and those working in the art sector feel obliged to describe the value of what they do almost exclusively in monetary terms. I do understand why this is so. There's a need to justify public funding and attract more sponsorship. However, I think that it is counterproductive as it does not demonstrate the complexity inherent in the true value of arts for humanity and society. How can we change this narrative in a way that will provide greater stability for the industry and also um, achieve greater acceptance at a political level? 
Is it time for constitutional change? Could we perhaps insert a new arts chapter in front of the finance and trade chapter in the Australian constitution? In Germany, this was done following the devastation of World War II. And I feel that this anchoring at a constitutional level of the value of arts for humanity, it changes the level at which every discussion about the arts and its value and its funding, I, it changes the level at which any of these discussions begin. What do you think about this? That's a, a complex question. And I think, George, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, I'll follow to you. But I think one of the interesting things that I often um, come across is the need for people to somehow separate the art, in, the, the idea of arts in terms of its intrinsic value, your know, art art for art's sake, art and what it is, and it's instrumental, what art does. And the answer that I always respond with, well, it's both, and that's where its great power lies. So you get that enormous economic contribution, which arts and creativity absolutely drive. And then you get all those extraordinary benefits to uh, social cohesion, to health, to well-being, um, to the education of children, to uh, the, you know, it, it goes to soft power and our perception internationally and all those sorts of things. So I think there's, um, it, it needs to be considered always in recognition of all the things that arts and creativity do. In terms of that recognition, George, I'm, I might throw to you, I'm, I'm no constitutional scholar, but I do think um, there's the tendency to think about investment in the arts as simply putting money into the pockets of artists, as opposed to actually recognising that that investment is investing in the benefit for the broader Australian public. But what's your thoughts on that question? Um, it was a very interesting question. She's anticipated some of our discussion too. Uh, mm. But on the constitutional Framing, I think uh, it'd be very difficult to get to get politics to put any question to the people because we have a pretty poor record. Uh, we haven't had a referendum since 1999, and that was for an Australian uh, head of state, and that thing went down. Uh, we do have a very very important constitutional reform on the table, which is the Uluru Statement, and I think if we could get that voice up, uh, so it almost answers the the value of arts and culture question in another way because uh, as I mentioned earlier I think the storytelling needs to needs the new storytelling in Australia needs to start from a First Nations perspective mm. from a welcome to country perspective which recognizes the fact that we are uh, people of many backgrounds and have come from all over the world but the custodians of the land are the ones who've been here long enough to know what makes this country tick that's that part of it. So in a sense, the constitutional question, I understand the German perspective, but it's it, it very difficult to replicate a scenario where you could pull it off here. But there is another, there is another part to thinking of the value of the arts, and, and, I'll, try and I'll try and get in the head of, the, of not just the, a conservative government, we've got a coalition government, a Liberal and National Party, but also a Labor Party seeking power um, uh, by trying to pick up seats in the regions because that's where a lot of their problem is. In regional Australia today, there's a very simple equation uh, that concerns me as, a, as sort of an Australian and also and especially as an economist, but mostly as an Australian. Uh, the movement of people into and out of the regions is creating a divide between country and city uh, that is a divide that we haven't seen before in Australia. And that is basically based on age and education opportunity. So a lot of regional Australia now is in a position where people aged 65 and over already outnumber kids under the age of 15. And when you get a circumstance like that in a region, uh, you actually accelerate the departure of young people to the cities because the job mix in the regional area shifts towards age care and shifts towards health. In that context, it's very difficult to say if I, if I were the, not that I'd ever want to be, but say I was the CEO of the AFL, and I'm getting reports back from these regions that a lot of football clubs can no longer field a team because all the young kids are leaving. At that point, what do you do? Do you start ploughing money in to get a whole lot of older people to play footy? Or do you think about the next level down in terms of co your cohesion story, which is in the art space? So that's where, in a sense, a lot of the social infrastructure that starts to fray when societies age, the most important part of that social infrastructure that needs to be, to be not only sustained but elevated is the arts, because that's what keeps people connected. 
And I think the sector, if the sector can start thinking across jurisdictions uh, in these sorts of ways, uh, they're not just thinking about um, sort of the dollars and cents for the, uh, for the top tier um, capital city based organisations. They're not thinking about rattling the tin to high end donors. They're actually thinking about connecting with every Australian. And the story in every part of Australia will be different because every part of Australia now is different. And it's different, not, and I mentioned, we were mentioning earlier in terms of diversity, it's now different, and the biggest difference, it's different in other ways, but the biggest difference is age. And when you get ageing aging regions and cities, not necessarily getting younger, but getting more diverse and more cosmopolitan, keeping that country together and reconnecting that country involves a big investment at the grassroots and the arts. So that's the argument I would probably be making in terms of elevating the importance of the arts. In a sense, it's, it's social glue, and it probably becomes more important as society's age, even than something like sport, which the culture tended to prioritise in the past. Now, I think it's probably time for me to throw a question to you. Um, Viren, who's also in Melbourne. Thank you. When we imagine our future workforce, including issues of automation and rapid industry change, how can we ensure that human skills we offer are included in the building of jobs? Yes, so we touched on that a little bit earlier, didn't we, George? I think um, we recently did a very interesting research study with the Sydney Opera House where they have this great program which they do um, in schools. It's called Creativity and Learning and they have done it with a number of schools in Western Sydney. And what we did at the Australia Council was follow along the journey of that program where basically the schools asked to think of a question, um, then spend a lot of time uh, realising that question into an artistic project which they get to then present at a festival on stage at the Opera House, which is quite extraordinary because for a lot of these kids, you know, the idea of the Opera House is, is something which seems far off in the distance, but the idea of actually going into the green room and then getting on stage and performing at it takes it to another level. Um, but I think one of the key things, so an artist goes into the schools and works for 20 weeks with the students to realise that project. And what we found was that it had um, a transformational impact on the children in terms of their confidence, in terms of their creativity, in terms of their problem solving, in terms of their ability to... Uh, performing non-arts related subjects as well. It also had this extraordinary impact on the teaching faculty as well because it, it transformed their teaching practice and re-enlivened it and also had an impact on their own, on their well-being and their general sense of, of um, happiness and satisfaction in terms of their teaching work and on the school community, the parents and so on, it brought them closer and it also meant that the Opera House had these amazing uh, long-term relationships with the communities as opposed to the tra transactional kind of here, buy a ticket, see a show and then leave the building. But I think um, the embedding of creativity in terms of our education process is pretty vital when you think about all the indicators and all the research for, for what the jobs of the future need to be. Um, but I think one of the, the wicked questions around that, as well as that a lot of education policy tends to be driven at a state level as well. So you need to think about how you can actually push forward that, that change in a national way. But George, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think it's a really good question and I think it almost leads you to, to the intervention at the education level, which is to make the arts a compulsory unit, the way you do PE. And in a sense, that's such a simple way to look at it uh, that all the other questions um, can then uh, can be generated at the school level. So in a sense, once you prioritise it, again, you let a trillion flowers bloom. The um, interesting thing for me at the moment, so the project you describe is, uh, is uh, inviting itself into the school space in a way, you know, pitching to a school and the school doing it. Um, I'd be looking at the other way for the structural reform is that you put the asset on every education department to make um, this side of it compulsory. Now, the other way to think about it is you think about... And most, gov most state governments will think about it in terms of disadvantaged kids, in terms of uh, giving every kid that enters school an equal opportunity. Uh, PE gets them fitter, but doesn't necessarily help them in the brain. And I say this as someone who loves their sport. But the creative side of the brain can only really be opened after the basics are done for, for reading and teaching kids how to play um, when they're younger. Uh, the creative side of the brain for disadvantaged kids could only really be open in the arts sphere, not in the sports sphere. 
And I say, as I say, I've got to reiterate, I say this is someone who loves their sport. That wouldn't be my priority. My priority would be, to, in a sense, to even put the arts ahead of PE. It's interesting. We've, we've also been doing a longitudinal survey in terms of how Australians connect and engage with the arts. And the way that young people experience the arts is, is really powerful. So they are amongst the biggest consumers and the highest engagers with arts and culture. Um, they value it, they give time and money to it. Um, more so, it, it, this is something which seems to decrease over time as you know people get busy or, or it gets drummed out of them. But the way that is, it's very interesting to see the way that young people consider arts and culture as a very similar way to the way that they consider sport in terms of health and wellbeing. They actually see it as essential to their health and wellbeing. This isn't an optional thing. This is just as important as, you know, playing footy or, or you know, doing your swimming lessons or the rest of it. it it's actually a growing awareness of the essential, um, the essential nature of, of arts for them to be, to live a full and um, happy life. And I think that bodes really well for the future. But our final audience question this evening is from Kate Power, based in Brisbane. Why do Australian media not cover arts and culture in the same way they cover sport? Why isn't there an arts and culture section in every evening TV news broadcast? And why are arts and culture stories on TV often framed as human interest stories, like arts company visits aged care centre, rather than just straight reporting on art and culture? George, shall I throw to you on that one? Uh, she's read our minds, hasn't she? <laughs> Great question. Um, thinking about how you would, um, you would fix this from a media perspective, and obviously my background was in print journalism uh, for a number of years, 27 years at uh, various news limited publications from the Melbourne Sun all the way up to the Australian. Uh, I don't think it's possible to tell commercial media how to prioritise stories, but we do have this institution, it's almost uniquely Australian, which is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I'd, I'd put the asset on the ABC, uh, I'd make them honour the, honour that part of their charter but you'd have to fund that and you'd have to guarantee the funding. So if the ABC News Bulletin uh, is able to treat the arts in the same way it treats sport and it does really well on sport, um, then it sends a signal to the private media market that this thing is worth covering. And I think that these things, these conversations, these particular conversations about media always start at what the ABC can give you space and permission to do. And as I say, I would I mean, I have a number of reasons I have to declare a vested interest. Of course, I have done work for the ABC and have continued working with the ABC, but I think you need to fund that organisation properly um, to be able to address these sorts of um, issues of national importance. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, an interesting question. I think we also um, often there's a very narrow perception of, of what art is as well. And when people think of art, they tend to think of uh, traditional Western forms like opera, orchestra and ballet and not recognise all the kinds of art that you experience um, in your daily life, whether it's the book on your coffee table or the music in your headphones when you're on the, the train or, or so on. So I think um, it is one of the things, in my family we have this hilarious, well we think it's hilarious, this, because art, it's our own little hashtag where you look at something and think that has made someone's life better because art. And I think um, how that gets reported in the media is, is, an, is an interesting thing because we know that that makes such a difference in terms of public perception. I know there's been a lot, and George you'll be aware of this too, there's been a lot of attempts to to have an arts segment and I think the the devil in the detail is making sure that it doesn't appear to be earnest or um, actually only targeted at a certain elite subsection of the community that it genuinely is um, a, a piece that is speaking to the broader Australian public. Um, George, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you um, and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, and to all of you, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope you can join us on the next episode where um, CEO of the Australia Council, Adrian Collette, will be talking to Georgie Harmon, who's the CEO of Beyond Blue, about arts and health and wellbeing. Feel free to head to our website to jump on to register for that one if you haven't already. And take care and good night and thank you, George. Thank you.